it's so easy to come into the kingdom and come into the Father's love. The enemy is working so hard. He's working overtime to keep you from the revelation of the love of, of the Father. He's keeping you in this state of wanting to clutch onto sin. It's the silliest thing in the world, and it makes no sense. But because we're blinded with this shroud of sin, because sin blinds, how many of you know that? And so when we're blinded by sin, we clutch onto it, and we think this is good for us because it feels good at the moment. There are many things that feel good at the moment that are going to damage you later. Come on, somebody. You with me? Taught us how to dance, to celebrate with all we have, and we'll dance to thank you for mercy. Your glory taught us how to shout, lift your name in all the earth, and we'll shout to the praise of your glory. It's the overflow of our forgiven soul, and now we've seen you, God. Our hearts cannot stay silent. We'll be a dancing generation, dancing because of your great mercy, Lord. Your great mercy, Lord. It will be a shouting generation. Shouting because of your great glory, Lord. Your great glory, Lord. Yeah. How many came to celebrate this morning? Your mercy taught us how to dance, to celebrate with all we have, and dance to thank you for mercy. Taught us how to shout, to lift your name in all the earth and shout to the praise of your glory. It's the overflow of our forgiven soul, and now we see you, God. Our hearts cannot stay silent. We'll be dancing generation. Your great mercy, Lord. Your great mercy, Lord. It will be a shouting generation, shouting because of Your great glory, Lord. Your great glory, Lord. How many dancers we got in the house? Come on, kids, you ready? And we'll dance! Come on, sing, it's the overflow. Well, it's the overflow of a forgiving soul. And now we've seen you, God. Our hearts cannot stay silent. It will be a dancing generation, dancing because of your great mercy, Lord. Your great mercy, Lord. It will be a shouting generation, shouting because of your great glory, Lord. Your 
coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, sing it out. And our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, and every knee will bow before Whoa. So open up the gate, make way. Set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's a roaring with power, he's fighting a battle. Every knee will bow before Our God is a lamb, the lamb that will slay for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the lion and the man. Every knee will bow before him. Come on, how many here know that he's breaking chains even this morning, amen? Hey, yeah. Sing, you can stop. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop? There is no one like you, Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, yeah. Who can stop the Lord Lift up some shout to God this morning. Yes, Lord. How many here know that his blood that he shed is breaking chains right now? Amen. Come on, let's just receive that this morning. Just say, I receive your blood, Lord, in every part of my life. I trust that it breaks chains. Lord, if you had to over and over again, you'd do it for me, Lord, over and over again. If I was the only one, Lord, you would have died just for me if I was the only one on the earth. How many here know it's personal that Jesus died for you? Come on, let's just declare that victory. Because the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift.
lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praise. Here. Come on, sing it out. Cause the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. Cause the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna lift our voice in revelation from heaven I release Lord God your holy word I release Lord God the presence of the kingdom of God and Holy Spirit in this place I release Lord God every good thing that you have for every person in this place in Jesus mighty name and all the people of God said Amen. now put your hand on your head real quick Say, now in Jesus' name, I choose to receive what you have for me, God, and shout amen. amen. All right, you can be seated. Hey, let me, uh, let me um, 
just encourage you uh, about the declarations. When I was growing up, I, I grew up in the United Methodist Church. How many grew up United Methodist? Let me see your hands. Wave it at me. Yeah, how many grew up Baptist? Let me see your hands. How many grew up Catholic? Let me see your hands. How many never grew up? <laughs> well, there's a lot of self-awareness in this room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I grew up United Methodist, and, um, and, and you know, we, we always had these, these hymnals that, that we sang out of, and I loved singing. You know, growing up, I just really enjoyed um, just singing out of the hymnals and stuff. Um, and, and, and in different parts of, of the hymnals, you would have these, well, these, these writings like the Apostles' Creed, and we would read the Apostles' Creed, and, um, and you would have different declarations that you make on, on different, uh, you know, different celebrations like uh, Christmas and Easter and, and Good Friday and those kind of things. And, you know, for me, uh, some of those things did not have a lot of life in them. And it wasn't because of those things, and it wasn't because of the leadership. It was because of me. It was because I didn't embrace what God was saying and doing through those things. You know, and as we were, were reading the declaration this morning, um, I got thinking about it, and I thought, you know, I, I never want us to get to the place where we're just going through the motions of reading these things because uh, the, the reading that without embracing it, will have some benefit. It's better than not reading at all. But what, what if you actually embraced the words that were being said and allowed them to become part of you? Touch someone and say, allow them to become part of you. You know, the same is true of, of, of the worship. I mean, what if, what if you actually believe... Do you realize how powerful some of these songs are that we, I mean, if, 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 if we literally walked those out, oh my gosh, we would be terrifying to the enemy. Amen. And, uh, and how many of you know God wants you to be terrifying to the enemy? Amen. Well, here's the thing. If you don't become terrifying to the enemy, you will become terrified by the enemy. Amen. And, and, you know, I just, I know a lot of Christians just walk around scared all the time. Talking about doom and gloom, the end is coming and the sky is falling and, you know, they stand up on their roof doing rapture practice, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that was mean. That shouldn't have been said, probably. But it felt good right there. <laughs> all right. And so, listen, I, I, got, I, I have a, um, a word for you that I want to share. Um, I'm kind of chewing on this thing and um, I, I want to talk today about a revelation of love. Um, th there are many words in, in the Word of God, in the Bible, that describe the word love. Everyone say love. love. Now, in English, we have one word that describes it. We have the word L-O-V-E, love. But, but in, the, in the Greek that the New Testament was written in, there are at least four words that describe the word love. Um, there is phileo, there is eros, there is one that isn't used very often, so we don't need to talk about that. And then there is agape. Everyone say phileo, uh, eros, and agape. Now, phileo is real simple, um, and, and it comes, uh, the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, um, is, that's, it comes from the, the Greek word phileo. And it means to love in such a way that a demand can be placed on you and you receive life from that demand being placed on you. Now, that's not normal, right? When you do something for someone else, it normally takes away from you. Like, for example, if you give up your Saturday to help someone move, right? That takes away from your day. But, but when you're walking in phileo, it's a little bit different. Actually, when you walk out phileo, you can help someone move and it brings more life to you. You get life from that because you're walking in that God-ordained phileo, brotherly love, that I enjoy to the extent that I am getting more life than what I'm giving up. Does that make sense? And, and part of our Christian walk, as a matter of fact, the step 
right before agape, the last step before you get to agape is phileo. So we have to learn to walk in phileo where we allow someone to place a demand on us and it brings life from us. Now, in the same way with phileo, that I allow you to place a demand on me, you allow me to say no to your demand and it doesn't bother you. Like you can ask me to help you with something or do something for you and I can say, no, I, I don't want to. And you don't say, why not? See, that's what phileo is. That's how phileo works in the body of Christ where we can call on each other. And I don't have to feel weird about calling up Carmen and saying, hey, will you help me with such and such? Because I know he has the freedom to say no if it's not something he wants to do. And there's a freedom in that. Do you, do you see that? And that's phileo. Eros, eros is a kind of love that is very self-centered. It is, it is the kind of love that I'm looking to satisfy myself and what I want. It's not the best form of love. As a matter of fact, it can often be a very damaging form of love. It's the kind of love I walk in where, where um, the, the interesting thing about eros is that it can look a lot like agape. It can be cloaked and look like agape, but it's really not. For example, you do some harm to me, let's say. And, and I say, oh, I forgive you if you say you're sorry. Why do you have to say you're sorry? As a matter of fact, didn't Jesus say that he forgave us while we were still in our sin? While we were yet sinning, he forgave. Think about that. And so God doesn't put that demand on us for you to do something. When, when my forgiveness is conditional, it is eros. It is not agape. Are you with me? And so we, we never want to walk in eros. We, we never want to walk in, in, in a that, that I am after seeking my own. Do you, do, you, do you understand? Does that make sense, right? So agape, conversely, is a self-giving self-sharing, sacrificially type of love. Where, where I give to you without wanting something in return, without the, the hook. <laughs> we had, when, when I was growing up, my dad had this incredible wisdom to have sheep. Thank you, Father. <laughs> and so, of course, we being his sons, we were engaged in having sheep. Woohoo! I'm a shepherd. <laughs> I mean, at least when you're a cowboy, that sounds a little bit kind of macho, but like a shepherd. I'm a shepherd. I have a shepherd's crook. And, you know, I would walk around like you literally, when you're trying to catch the sheep, you know the hooks they have, the, the canes with the hook on the end? There's a use for that hook. It's when the sheep runs by, you hit it in the neck, and that hook catches it by the head. And usually the sheep, if they fight real hard, it jerks them off their feet. I used to like that because I. <laughs> because anytime you'd get touched by the sheep, they've got this stuff in their wool. It's called lanolin. And it gets on you and it's smelly. And dad would make us go down and do something with the sheep in the morning before school. And if you got touched by one of them sheep, like you were going to smell that way all day. And how many of you know it's not the best thing in the world to smell like sheep when you go to high school? <laughs> What's that smell? Nothing. There's a quality of that, of that though, of that lanolin. How many of you know they put that in hand lotion? Why? Because it makes your skin soft. There's a softening that takes place when you brush up against the sheep. When you're a leader, leaders who don't brush up against the sheep, they tend to get kind of hard and crusty. But you can tell a leader that's in the midst of the sheep because they stay soft. Are you with me? That's just a little rabbit trail. That's free. You get that one for free, all right? We're not going to take up a second offering for that, all right? So agape. Agape is the kind of love that Jesus walked in. Agape is, 
is that when, when, well, let me, let me read this to you. Um, turn to Romans 5, 8. Let's look at that verse just real quickly. Let's, let's take a look. Let's read it together. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let's read that one more time. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One more time. Let's read it together. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Can we, can we put that in, in the personal, in the first person? Can we say instead of, of us, can we say I or, or me? Um, and then I. But when God demonstrates his own love toward me in that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Now, that's important. Because we, we get an idea of this Christian walk by how others walk. And, and look, being in community in the body of Christ is important. But, but how many of you know that, that I don't walk according to your walk, I walk according to his walk? And so... So Jesus demonstrated the love that he had towards me and towards you by before I ever changed. While I was still in sin, he died for me. Last night, Janice and, and Marie, who's visiting us from all the way from Columbus, Ohio, give Marie a hand clap. Welcome, welcome. And uh, we we're having a discussion about that. And and we got talking about how we express agape and, and how, how God, his love is to go through us. And, and how many of you know that it is God's desire that we agape? How many of you know that, that we love? How many of you believe that? Bang your hands together. Well, if, if you don't know that, let me share that with you. Um, you are made in the image and likeness of God, and God is love. And if God is love and you're made in his image and likeness, then you are love, or at least you're to be love. You're not to try to love. When you try to love, when you try to agape, you are not going to agape. You can't try to love, you must be love. And the only way you can actually be love is be connected to the heart of the Father, because only true love comes from the Father. Are you with me? Like, if you don't have your heart connected to... One of the ways that you know that your heart is not connected to the Father is that you don't agape. And, and, and we, 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 we look like we agape. We put on the smiley face and the nice clothes when we come in. And we smile and we, we make it look like we love each other when underneath there may be different kind of thoughts going on. And Jesus said this so much, when you eat of this table, the bread and the cup, when you eat of this table, do not eat of this table when you have ought against your brother because you're drinking sickness, because you're not discerning correctly the body of Christ, and you're literally drinking sickness on yourself. Why? Because it's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. It is, it is not agape. It is eros. You are wanting to look the part. You're wanting to act the part. You're wanting the benefit of being in the Christian walk without walking the Christian walk. You're wanting to act out love rather than being love. And, and the word of God says that don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Because that gives the enemy fuel. It gives the enemy paper on you. He goes into the courts of God and he demands your destruction. He demands your curse. He demands you to be brought down low. He demands for their bad things to occur in your life. And so we need to be free. We need to be like Teflon, where nothing of the enemy sticks to us. But we can't do that unless we walk in agape. Our whole school system right now teaches children to walk in eros. It's all about me. Let me be entertained. Let me be satisfied. Let me feel good about myself. It's all about me. And they come the whole way through, and they come out of college, and it's all about me. And they struggle. 
with loving others. They struggle with giving of themselves unless there's something I get in return. Why should I give? Why should I do that for them? Because you love. See, Jesus demonstrated agape. One of the ways that we know that agape is at work is we're, we're sacrificially giving and sharing ourselves. And one of the ways that can be demonstrated is, is when we, we give, when we give our finances, when we give our time, when we give our love, when we give to each other. But, it, but it's interesting how many of you like to give? Let me see your hands. You, you love to give to other people. Wave them real high. Yeah, okay. Yeah, me too. I, I like to give. How many like to give when someone steals from you? Let me see your hands. Come on, wave them high. Come on, everybody, wave them high, real high. When, when you're being stolen from, you like that. Yeah, okay. I didn't think so. How many like to give when people expect it from you? Come on, I can't see your hands. Put them up a little higher. Okay, all right. All right, thank you. Why is that? Because I, I didn't give it. You're stealing from me. I didn't choose to give that to you. You took it from me. I understand that, stealing sin. What about, what about the person who expects to receive from you? I, I don't like to give to them either. Why? Well, because they're expecting it. And I, that doesn't feel good. I mean, I give it to someone and, and they, they were presumptuous or they were expecting me to give it to them. And I don't want them to expect to receive it from me. I want to give it without them expecting it. Well, what if God told them that you're going to give it to them? Shouldn't they expect it then? Well, wait a minute. I mean, see, the root of the issue is that I don't like to give unless I get something back in return. I don't like to give unless I feel good about it. Well, what if you don't feel good about it? Is it still God? Well, it could be. I think oftentimes... I mean, what if, what if giving to God, you don't get a tax benefit? What if giving to God, he doesn't multiply what you give and give it, although he does, and we walk that out. But what if he didn't? What if he expected you to give to him and gave you nothing in return? I mean, the way it works right now, and we know it to be true, it's a spiritual principle. I give to God 10% of my income, and he gives me back 100%. Well, that's a good deal. But what if he didn't? What if it was just me giving to him? Would I be able to do that? Well, that's agape, expecting nothing in return. You say, well, no, no, that's messed up. That, that doesn't make sense. God never wants me to do that. God never wants me to give when someone is demanding or stealing from me or taking from me. And may I suggest to you that that may not be true. Well, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 23, verse 33. It says, when they came to the place called the skull, Golgotha. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was crucified in a place called the skull? Isn't it interesting that there had to be a death on a place called the skull? Human intellect is good, but revelation from heaven is far better. Oftentimes, 
we only look at things based on our intellect and not based on what God is saying about the issue. And because of that, we have a very short-sighted, limited view on what's going on. So, so Jesus was crucified in a place called the skull. And it says, and there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Now, I want you to get this picture. Jesus was called by God to give his life for the sins of many. But at the same time, there were men who were about to steal his life. The greatest act of love that has ever been committed on this planet was committed in this tension. This tension of Jesus' life being stolen away from him. He didn't deserve to die. He was convicted in a trumped up charge. People lied about him. There were those there who, who were jealous of him and wanted his life taken from him because they were afraid of him. They were afraid of the transformation that he was talking about that was the antithesis of what they were walking in. There were soldiers who stole away the flesh on his body, who took away his identity, who stripped him naked. I, I, I believe, not to be coarse, but I believe Jesus was crucified completely naked. He's the king of all kings. And they took away, stole his dignity. And he not only allowed them, but helped them in the process. I'll never forget in Mel Gibson's depiction of the crucifixion, there's a scene where they're about to nail him to the cross and you see Jesus crawling toward the cross. Crawling toward them stealing his life from him. And he wasn't offended. As a matter of fact, he says these words that we see so that what they were about to do did not get accounted toward them. But Jesus said what they're doing as he laid out his poem and drove the nails in his hands when he heard the ping of the hammer and the piercing of pain in his body, he shouted to God, No! Don't count this toward them! Put it on me! Forgive them, God! Agape. Wow, they are stealing. Oh no, you steal from me. I'm going to deal with you. You expect me to give you something? I'm not going to give it to you. You need to smile and at, at least ask politely. Really? So you need something in return to give. That's Eros. I'm here to tell you that God is about to bring a revelation of love to the body of Christ that can cause us to become bulletproof, that can cause us to become like Teflon, that can cause us to have nothing stick to us, that every work of the enemy, everything he's ever trumped up, anything that he's ever tried will not manifest itself if we walk in a revelation of agape. I can't be offended by you if I love you. Love covers the multitude of offenses. I cannot hold aught against you in my heart 
if I love you because I am all about you. I am all about your highest and your best. I am all about what will bring you to the pinnacle of what God has for you. And I'm cheering you on the way, even when you're spitting on me. Because that's the example that our Lord gave us. Now, it's wrong for you to spit on me. It's wrong for the soldiers to pound nails in his hands. It's wrong for them to trump up charges. And God will deal with them. But I'm not going to. I put that in God's hands. Because I want for them not justice. I want mercy. Jesus said, mercy God. Not for himself. He wasn't begging for his own life. Listen, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called legions upon legions of angels. And in a heartbeat, he could have had the complete Roman army annihilated. He could have had every demon on the earth turned to dust. But he chose to give himself as a ransom for all of us. It was his choice. It was his agape. What if? What if we had a revelation of agape? You say, well, okay, but how do I get that? That's a fair question. There's only one source of agape. There's only one source. You don't have it within you. Your neighbor doesn't have it. Your parents don't have it. Good schooling doesn't have it. A good job doesn't have it. A bigger house doesn't have it. There's only one source of agape. There's only one way you can get agape. That is for your heart to be fully connected to the Father's heart. It's the only source. That's why the enemy works so hard at messing with us in our identity of the Father. That's why he's worked so hard in, in, in trying to get fathers to fail. That's why he, the enemy works so hard at creating all of this media that tears down fathers and makes them look like idiots and dolts and, and losers. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want you to get a revelation of the Father and his perfect love for you. Oh no, he doesn't mind if you see God as wearing this black robe with this nasty old hood and this sickle in his hand and this bony old finger that comes out from under his robe and points at you and saying, you shall be damned. You can't be damned unless you hold on to sin. It's the only way. It's so easy to come into the kingdom and come into the Father's love. The enemy is working so hard. He's working overtime to keep you from the revelation of the love of, of the Father. He's keeping you in this state of wanting to clutch onto sin. It's the silliest thing in the world, and it makes no sense. But because we're blinded with this shroud of sin, because sin blinds, how many of you know that? And so when we're blinded by sin, we clutch onto it and we think this is good for us because it feels good at the moment. There are many things that feel good at the moment that are going to damage you later. Come on, somebody. You with me? I mean, look, I can pound down some serious cheesecake, but how many know I'm going to pay a price later? Are you with me? <laughs> I, I, I can spend my, my mortgage money and it might feel good if I'm at the track spending my mortgage money and playing the slots or playing blackjack or whatever, but how many of you know I'm going to pay a price later? I'm not going to have a home. Are you with me? It might feel good now, but it's not good for me later. Are you with me? And look, God's just opening himself up. As a matter of fact, he sent his own son as an example to show you how easy it is to connect to the love of the Father. How you just let go of this and open up over here. It's that simple. Touch someone and say, it's that simple. And we can hold on to this if we want to, but Why? Because, see, Jesus doesn't desire to judge people. He desires to judge sin. It's sin that he desires to send to hell because that's where it belongs. But if you're holding on to sin, you get to go with it. Come on, somebody. It's really hard to not accept the Father's love. you got to work at it. And how many of you know we're going to make it a whole lot harder in this city? 
How many of you know in this region, we're going to make it a whole lot harder to hold on to sin? How many of you know, we're about to make it a whole lot harder not to receive the Father's love? Because we are going to get bulletproof. We are going to be like Teflon. Why? Because we're going to connect to the Father in a fresh new way. We're going to connect to the Father in such a way that his love is flowing through you and you cannot get offended unless you want to. You can't step in. You can't fall into sin. Oh, you can take a high dive. Oh, you can get up on it. Oh, I fell into sin. Oh, so falling into sin looks like this. You walk out on the diving board and bounce a couple times and dive in. That, I guess, is falling into sin, but you meant it. Look, he wants to connect with his love. He wants to overwhelm you with his goodness. He wants to overwhelm you with how forgiven you are and how amazing you are and how unbelievable you are. All you got to do is let go of that and open up over here. Are you with me? That's all Jesus did. I mean, he, he's living his life. He's 30 years old. And he's led by the Spirit down to the river. And here's his cousin, Johnny Boy. It's baptizing. And he says, listen, you got to baptize me. And John has a revelation at that moment. No, no, no. It's, it's not, I should be baptizing. You should be baptizing me. I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. And, and Jesus says, look, look, do it, because this has to be done. And he puts him in the water. And when he comes out of the water, here is the son. The dove comes and lands on his shoulder. Holy Spirit comes, and the voice of the Father comes out of heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Before you ever took the test, you have an A. That's the way God works. Jesus never did any miracle up until that point, and God already says he's pleased with him. That's what being connected to the love of the Father does to you. You pass tests. You, get a, you ace tests before you ever take them. Why? Because that's the love of the Father. Provision is already at hand before you ever need it. That's the love of the Father. Before you ever sin, forgiveness was already made available to you. That's the love of the Father. Identity comes to you before you ever did anything to form yourself. Why? Because you are formed a whole lot better if you know who you are and walk out who you are rather than trying to walk out who you are to form an identity. That's the love of the Father. And that's what God wants for every one of us. It's not hard. Stop making it hard. The only reason it's hard is because you don't want to let go over here. But I promise you, this over here is killing you. This over here is destroying you. This over here is taking away from you. Well, how do I know that? Well, look how it's worked out so far. So Jesus stretches out his hands and he says these words, while they are stealing from him, Father, forgive them. They have no clue what they're doing. They're covered with the shroud of sin. They are blinded. How can you love someone and allow someone to steal from you? Because you understand they're blind. And anything that anybody steals from you, God will replace so fast. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to get in. What if, what if you didn't get frustrated with people? What if you didn't get angry with your spouse when they push that button yet the 142nd time? <laughs> what if you weren't afraid at school? What if you believed that all good things were working out for you? If you really believe that. What if you believed that your whole family was coming into the kingdom? It's not hard. You just have to let go over here and open up over here. Because the Father is wanting to connect to your heart. I, I, when I envision that, I... I how many of you ever seen a fire truck and on the fire truck there's those hoses, right? And there's the hoses they use to squirt out the fire, right? The, the, the ones that are real flexible. And, but then there's the, these, these long sections of hose 
on the, the side of the truck. And if there's a fireman here, you could probably, I think it's called hard suction. And, and they're hard rubber, right? But they have these connections on them. They're about this big around. And I kind of envision in connecting my heart to God, God desires to have this free flow of love between he and I to where there's no hindrance. And I, I, I envision that connection connecting into my heart and he taking that connection connecting into his heart and then the love begins to flow. That's the way it looks. How do you know if you're not walking in agape, there's fear. How do you know if you're not walking in agape? There's frustration, there's anxiety, there's no peace, there's no joy, there's no long suffering, there's no goodness, there's no faithfulness, there's no self control. God wants all those good things for you, and all it takes is you letting go over here and connecting right here, your heart to the Father's heart. And when his love begins to flow, it will be like drinking from a fire hose. Amen? Stand up as we close. Thank you, Lord. So... You have to be intentional about keeping that connection. I catch myself. The connection comes loose. Oh, it's there. I mean, I'm not going to let it off, but it's not really putting a lot of God's love on the inside of my heart. You have to be intentional. You have to check that connection pretty regular. Here's how you know when that connection is not solid. You're walking over there in that stuff. There's fear, there's doubt, there's unbelief. You get offended, you're angry. I mean, there's there's righteous anger, of course, but that's not usually the kind of anger we walk in, right? There's all kind of junk that's surrounding our lives. Please don't tell me you love God. You're connected with his heart and you're over here in this stuff. It's not true. Do you know how much pain it causes the father when you walk over here? I know I'm a father. I know what pain I feel when I see my kids becoming something there that God didn't create them to be. And parents know what I'm talking about? Of course it's painful. That's not love when we cause others pain. We don't have to walk over there. We just simply let it go. That's called repenting. I turn from that and turn over here and connect to his heart. Are you with me? And, and, and we have to be intentional. Daily, we have to check that connection. It's important. The moment that fear rises up, check the connection. Because there's no fear in perfect love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Are you with me? And so right now, I'm just going to ask you to check your connection. Just close your eyes. And if you feel free to, lift your hands up to God. Now listen, while you're doing that, if there's someone here who does not know Jesus as Lord of your life, at this moment, you can change all of that. And it's, it's so simple, it's so easy. You let go over here and connect over here. And you just tell him, Jesus, I receive you as Lord of my life. So just, if that's you, say that to him right now. Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Receive me and I receive you. I receive your life in exchange for my life. Your forgiveness in exchange for my sin. 
your provision in exchange for my need. And just with your heads bowed right now, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, I, I want you to let me know that because I want to pray for you this week. If you did that, just wave your hand at me real quick. Stick it up and wave it real hard. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now for all of us in this room, if you have fear, doubt, unbelief, you're walking in sin, whatever it is, if you have any of that in your heart, then that means you need to adjust the connection with the heart of the Father and let his love free flow into you. I promise you, you adjust your connection, it's already connected on his end. And so right now, just take and adjust that connection. If you feel any of those things, say to the Lord right now, Lord, I choose a full connection to your heart. Let the revelation of love flow to me. Tonight as I sleep, I ask you come to me and bring a greater revelation of your love. Today as I walk with my family, bring a greater revelation of my love, of your love for me. Lord, in this week, as I walk it out, bring a revelation of your love. Father, I pray over them now that we would be, we would be vessels of your agape, that we would walk this out daily, that, Lord, your love would flow through us, and we would be, Lord, we would be love. In Jesus' name, say, Lord, help me to be love to all of those around me. In Jesus' mighty name. You can put your hands down for a second. One of the greatest symbols of his love was when he sat with his family, his disciples, and they sat at a table and he broke bread with them. And he took that bread and that wine and he said, this is my body and this is my blood. And he gave to them as a symbol of him giving himself to them. And, and we're right now going to have the communion. Carl and Brenda, if I could have you all come. Carl and Brenda are part of our leadership team at City Church, and they're just amazing people filled with the love of God. Here, just hold up, you two. Come here. Just, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for agape. Father, as they serve the bread and the cup, let there be a revelation of agape flow through them now in Jesus' name, through the bread, through the cup, that every person eating of that bread, eating of that cup, drinking of that cup would receive now in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, one word of instruction. You're going to come up this aisle, so the ushers will help with that, and, and you can go on either side and return back to your seats or if you choose, it's, it's okay. We're going to dismiss, and, and you can go ahead and leave after you've taken communion. Also up here will be ministers, ministry team, if I could have you come, that if you need God to touch you, you need something from the Lord, you need prayer, um, they're here, they're skilled in ministering, uh, whatever it is that God needs to give you. And so feel free to come and uh, be ministered to by any of our ministry team. So lift your hands up because I'm about to send you out. So as soon as you're done, if you would come, if you feel to come to the table. Oh, by the way, one other thing. If you have any offense against anyone right now, don't eat of this table before you straighten out that offense. If you got issue with a brother or sister, especially if they're in here, then just go to them and say, listen, I love you. I've got an issue in my heart. It's on me and, and I want to work it out but I ask you to forgive me for carrying this issue in my heart and work it out later. You don't have to work it all out now, but work it out later. If you got someone at home that you've got an issue with, don't take communion with them. Or don't take communion when you have that in your heart. Get it right. Call them up and say, hey, listen, I love you. I've been mad at you. I want to work it out. It's on me. And so I just need to talk to you later about it. And then you can come and partake of the table. Amen? Does that make sense?
All right. So let me, let me pray and bless you. Father, I ask you bless them and keep them and make your face to shine on them. Lift up your countenance on them now and give them your grace and peace. Father, help us to be agape to this world. In Jesus' mighty name. And all the people of God said, amen. City Church, go and be blessed. I'll see you next week. Come and take of the table of the Lord and be ministered to.